from our presenting sponsor, Retzel and Andrus, please welcome Mr. Stephen Funk. Has been the justice on the Ohio Supreme Court for the past 20 years, and has been the chief justice for the past 12 years. As chief, Justice O'Connor not only serves on the Supreme Court, but she oversees the entire judicial branch of government and works regularly with bar association leaders, including Ron, who when he served as president of the Ohio State Bar Association. Now, many of you may think that uh, the chief is located in Columbus, but she actually lives here in Summit County. And before serving on the Ohio Supreme Court and as Ohio's Lieutenant Governor, she worked in Akron as a Summit County Prosecutor, as a Magistrate for the Summit County Probate Court, and as a Judge on the Summit County Court of Common Pleas. So she is frankly the crown jewel of the Akron legal community and has done a truly remarkable job as Chief Justice. And so we're so pleased to have her with us today. And please join me now in welcoming our Chief Justice, Maureen O'Connor. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Steve, and thank you for the invitation uh, to be here this morning. Um, I, um, uh, you know, as Chief Justice, I have a wide range of duties and opportunities. Uh, among them, I appreciate happy events like this, uh, where so we can honor someone who has given so much to the profession. Uh, next week, I'm going to oversee the admission of bar of the bar for hundreds of our newest attorneys. We have so many attorneys that we have a morning session and an afternoon session. I will talk to them about building a strong reputation, setting high standards for themselves, and being of service to others and to their community. I will be talking to them about the values and the example set by Ron Kopp. Many here can talk about his various community commitments and contributions, and others of you can speak to his time as president of the Leadership Akron Board of Trustees or the president of both the Ohio State Bar Association and the Akron Bar Association. And after, what, 43 years at Retzel, I know Steve and others can talk about his contributions to the firm. So I'd like to reflect a bit on my history with Ron. My friendship with Ron goes back many, many years. And when I started to reminisce, I thought of the various ways that we've interacted. I'm sure many of you recall, as was just mentioned, my days on the Common Pleas Court here in Summit County. Ron, being the civil litigant that he was, often appeared in front of me. Ron served his clients well at all times. I made it a practice to conduct all of my own pretrials early in the morning. I think Ron liked that. While others were yawning and clutching a cup of coffee as they came in, he always showed up, fresh as a daisy, ready to go and ready to make his case. As I moved on to be prosecuting attorney in 1995, Ron and I found ourselves to be on opposite sides of cases at times. It did not matter uh, for our professional relationship or the respect for that we had for one another. And Ron Kopp is no stranger to the Supreme Court of Ohio, having appeared before the court, I think, about 14 times in your career. You might say he got to the Supreme Court before I did. His first appearance was in 1983, still in his early years at Retzel. In 2007, Ron appeared before the Moyer Court, of which I was privileged to be a member. He knew that he was before a court that valued fairness and impartiality and judicial independence and he was not going to catch a break just because we go way back. He wouldn't want it any other way. Ron has stood for fairness, and he has stood up for fairness. In 2017, when the President of the United States disparaged a member of the judiciary, Ron stood up on behalf of all judges, not just Ohio judges. As President of the Ohio State Bar Association, Ron defended a fair and impartial judiciary and the co-equal branch of government, upon which good government and democracy relies, and to which we have dedicated our lives. It occurs to me how often it is how often uh, it is difficult to stand up to power. But when a leader denigrates the foundation of our democracy, we don't don't we wish that there were more Ron cops defending of the judiciary and good government. Ron is not afraid to speak up for what's right. May this community continue to benefit from your talents, my fearless friend. I apologize for not being able to stay for your entire program, but I could not let Ron be honored in this way and miss the opportunity to publicly thank him for his contribution for all of these years. Thank you, and God bless. Order of 
time that I spend on them are uh, uh, golf. I'm, I'm, I'm an avid golfer. Not very good at it, but I'm an avid <laughs> golfer. He is now um, golfing and no one is happier about that than me. A history of golf one year too, like a big history of golf book. And it went back through all the players and courses and um, you know how the game came to be. And I mean, yeah, so what Megan was saying, any history of anything he's into. Yes, his favorite and still is was golf. So he started playing golf um, at Brookside when he was very young. We were members there. Um, and then would actually sometimes even ride his bike or walk um, to Brickside. Well, and it wasn't, but it was still, you know, I'm going to say about a mile and a half, um, you know, to walk. But I think a lot of times he rode the bike and, um, and then started to drive, of course, when he was 16. So, uh, yeah, that, that was his passion and still is. On a normal track because the year before he told me, he played some ungodly amount of golf, maybe 129 rounds of golf. And you know, that's pretty difficult to do in Ohio. Some of that had to be out of state, I believe. It right. Was. And he was hopeful that in 2022, he would be able to exceed that number. And I was very pessimistic about that and said, Ron, I don't see how you're going to do that. I, and, I've enjoyed a lot of rounds of golf with him, or a few rounds of golf with him where I've taken, picked his pocket a little bit. And um, he's very, very uh, upset about that. Never lets me forget. He, he has beat me once or twice, but. Uh, um, it's more fun to pick his pocket because he is a terrible loser. Uh, I know he likes to play golf. Uh, <laughs> and I think he's a fairly accomplished player from what I understand. An avid golfer. Pretty intense golfer. Golfer. Golf. 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 <laughs> Akron is known as the rubber capital of the world, but there is so much more. From the All-America Soapbox Derby to the National and Metro Parks, Live from Fairlawn Country Club, it's the 10th Annual Lieberth Community Vision Masters Tournament. And now your hosts for today's event, Teresa Carter and Ann Manby. Good morning and welcome to day four of the 10th Annual Lieberth Community Vision Masters Tournament. We are broadcasting live from Akron, Ohio at the beautiful Fairlawn Country Club Golf Course. Once again, I am Teresa Carter, your host, and I'm sitting here today with my co-host, Ann Mamby. Good morning, Ann. Good morning, Teresa. It's great to be here with you today for the conclusion of our tournament. You know, this is always one of my favorite tournaments of the year. The leaders who participate are really top notch, and the tournament always features a really wonderful charitable organization. Absolutely, Ann. The nonprofit organization we will be highlighting throughout this day of the tournament will be the 4-H. 4-H organization does so much to engage youth to reach their fullest potential while advancing the field of youth development. We'll get to hear a little bit more about this organization and their 4-H values throughout the day. That's right, Teresa. I can't wait to hear more about that. It's been a fabulous tournament so far, and it's another perfect Northeast Ohio weather day. Ron Kopp has been in the running for the coveted green jacket since the first hole, but we've had some trouble catching up with him on the course. I'm hoping our course correspondent, Justin Hilton, is able to catch up with him between holes today. Rumor has it he's a pretty serious golfer, and when he puts his mind to something, he's totally focused, so it might be tricky. Justin, can you give us a look at the leaderboard as it stands as we begin day four of play? Yes, it's another great day here at Fairlawn Country Club, and the field is starting to really take shape. Laura Kolb has had the lead at six under par with both Karen Talbot and Dave Liebeth right on her heels, tied at just one stroke behind. Ron Kopp and Tim Fitzwater have some very strategic approaches yesterday, and we anticipate that kind of smart play will continue them in the running. Marie Covington and Rob Malone dominated the lawn game yesterday, but missed a few critical putts, which left them a little further behind, tied at par. David James and Brian Moore, on the other hand, boy, They've taken a full tour of this entire beautiful course, including the water hazards, including the sand traps. And it's gonna be really interesting to see how much more of these two get themselves into and out of. David has blamed his mediocre performance on spending way too much time reading chapter 3301 in the education library section of the Ohio Revised Code. I understand he'll be talking to his employer 
about increasing his PTO balance so that he can properly prioritize his golf game. Brian, on the other hand, he seemed generally confused and distracted the entire time. And I'm hoping to catch up with him a little bit later to learn what on earth is going on. He's really struggling out there. What's interesting about this field of players is that each one of them has actually won the tournament one time over the past nine years. And you yourself have won once too, Teresa, if I'm not mistaken. The only player who has yet to take the Liebreth Community Vision Masters Tournament title is Ron Kopp. He has a great chance to come away with a win today, so we'll have to keep all of our eyes watching to see if he can emerge as the top leader at the end of the day. There's your update. As we get started, back to you, Teresa. Thanks so much for that update, Justin. Now let's take a minute to learn a little bit more about our charity of focus today. We have a special guest joining us who is familiar with the 4-H organization. Holly Mansiger was a member of 4-H herself as a child and continues to be an advocate for the organization. Welcome to our broadcast, Holly. Thank you for inviting me today to share a little bit about 4-H. For me, it provided the opportunities of developing lifelong memories, skills, and most important, lifelong friendships. It taught me and most of us to care about lives well beyond our own, which is quite an undertaking and an accomplishment when you think about working with squirrely teens most of the time. Being a 4-H member requires literally years of commitment to whatever area of interest you might have. In my case, it was horses, and for all of my friends, it was horses. I think that probably the 4-H motto captures the essence of what this organization is all about. And with your permission, I'd love to share with your audience what that motto is. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Those four cornerstone values, head, heart, hands, and health, have served as guideposts for many of us who have been part of 4-H. Thanks so much for sharing the 4-H pledge with us today, Holly. That sure would be a great foundation for any future leader. Holly, I heard a rumor that you actually participated in 4-H horse shows with one of today's tournament participants. Is that true? Yep, that's right. I was in 4-H with Ron Kopp for a number of years. We, along with our other dear friends, spent countless hours at Mount Pleasant Stables in North Canton, Ohio, honing our horse riding skills. We were fierce competitors at the horse shows at the Stark County Fairgrounds. But also, and most importantly, we're, we were diehard supporters of each other, despite the competition. Ron and I have remained friends for over 50 years, which, oh my gosh, is just totally unbelievable to me, but it's something I treasure. In thinking about today, and in particular, Ron, I think he epitomizes the 4-H pledge. He is loyal to the core, dedicating his life to his family, career, and his community. Now, while I don't know all of the talented golfers out here today, I do know Ron Kopp. And if it's anything like 4-H competitions, Ron will definitely be bringing home the blue. I don't think you're the only one pulling for Ron today, Holly. Many of the spectators out on the course seem to be drawn to his decisive, confident smile, style. Now let's see if our course correspondent has had the chance to catch up with Ron yet. I'm here on the third hole with David James. He just sank a beautiful putt and has agreed to talk with us for just a moment. Dave, how's, how's your game going today? And hopefully is it any better than it was yesterday? Well, Jess, and actually golf is not my best game. I'd much rather be in the clubhouse listening to some jazz or working on my master plan to improve school systems one district at a time. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Oh. oh. Wait, I think I hear some people cheering 
up on the next hole, I guess after Ron Cop's last shot. You know, Ron is a pretty serious golfer, uh, I hear, yeah. and I know he's pretty serious about a lot of things. I mean, he is a, a clear thinker, a great strategist, and Ron's reputation as an attorney is stellar. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you, it's really no surprise that Ron is one of the favorites to win today. You know, he's been a winner his whole career. And just as you mentioned, we all know him off the golf course as an outstanding attorney and really at the top of his field. But for some of our viewers who may not know, he's actually been an exceptional trial attorney for many, many years and also has an intense passion for genealogy, which is very interesting. Well, I think our studio team has some footage from people who are close to Ron and can share a little bit more. Thank you so much, David. You're welcome. The first real contact I had with Ron was a case that we had together early in our careers. Um, it was one of my first jury trials. It may have been one of Ron's first jury trials where we were both uh, asserting claims against a large national retailer um, who was represented by a local lawyer who was very full of himself and much older than we are or were. and. Um, explained to us during the course of the trial how how solid his case was and how uh, he had the jury eating out of his hand and Ron and I looked at each other after we had that conversation with the opposing lawyer and thought well gee you know we're really over our heads here we're probably not going to do very well maybe we ought to think about different careers because this isn't really the way it was supposed to go and uh, the jury went out and Ron and I are nervously awaiting its decision and they came back and, and asked a, a question, which always causes lawyers to, to sweat a little bit when, when they hear that. But the jury's question was, uh, we'd like to know if we're limited in the amount of money we can award the plaintiff by the amount that they've asked for. Can we award them more than they've asked for? And at that point, we learned a valuable lesson about the pontificating that older lawyers can, can sometimes engage in with younger lawyers. because. We did very well in that case, and we became friends in that case and stayed friends for our entire career. Ron's an exceptional leader. I've served with him on multiple boards. He is collaborative, he is strategic, he is thoughtful, and he's a decision maker. He will facilitate reaching a decision. For many, many years, was um, consumed by genealogy of our families. He has traced his family, oh gosh, back to, I can't tell you what, what century, but he claims that he's related to Charlemagne. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he really enjoys genealogy. Wow, that's really interesting information about Ron Kopp. He, he seems like a very intelligent, decisive leader. Now we have another guest in our studio today who happens to know Ron professionally. So welcome Karen Lefton to our studio. Thank you, Teresa, delighted to be here. Now is this your first time at the Lieberth Community Vision Masters Tournament? Well, this is the first time I've been at the Masters Tournament with such wonderful masters, but the Lieberth Award Breakfast is always a terrific event, and I get my reservations in early. <laughs> well, we know you've had a chance to work alongside several of the tournament players, and we've been able to catch up with some of them on the course, but we haven't been quite fast enough to catch up with Ron Kopp yet. He seems to be pulling ahead as a fan favorite. What do you think it is about Ron that really draws people in? Wow, wow. <laughs> you know, Ron is such a remarkable human being. We first met in the 1980s when I was a young journalist at the Beacon Journal and he was a young lawyer at Retzel and Andrus, our outside counsel. I admired him from afar, from the very beginning. And after I became a lawyer, I moved into an in-house position at the Beacon Journal. We worked more closely together, and we shared a passion for media law. Ron is a fierce advocate for the First Amendment. What he was doing looked really fun. I wanted to stretch myself. I wanted to learn new skills. 
who better to reach out to than Ron Kopp? He selflessly, kindly coached me every step of the way. He helped me learn stuff he would have loved to have done himself. Early on, the newsroom had an open records issue that I took on myself. What I lacked in experience, I kind of made up for in enthusiasm, and I had Ron on speed dial. But the next thing I know, yikes, it had been set for oral argument at the Ohio Supreme Court. So I called Ron, of course. Ever calm, Ron invited me to his office, and he coached me for hours on how to do the most persuasive presentation in front of Ohio's highest court, how to address the justices, how to anticipate their questions, how to organize my notes, and yes, even what earrings not to wear. <laughs> uh, the case was about access to juror questionnaires, and we won, and it has my name on it, but it really should have Ron Cops. He literally, single-handedly, changed the trajectory of my career. That was back in 1998, and 20 years later, I had the opportunity to represent the Washington Post. That would not have happened but for Ron Kopp. I have thanked him privately, but now that we're both on the back nine of our careers, take this opportunity today to thank him publicly. And for all of you people watching from home or in the gallery, I leave you with one final thought. Our community is so blessed. There is no attorney in Northeastern Ohio who has more character, more class, more grace than Ron Kopp. Wow, thank you so much, Karen for sharing this with us. Ron seems like quite the leader on and off the course. I hope we can certainly catch up with him between, you know, holes sometime today. Now let's turn back over to our course correspondent, Justin, just for a quick second to see who is on the leaderboard and to see who he has caught up that he may be able to talk to at this time. Thanks, Teresa. I'm here at hole eight, just heading into the turn, and the leaders have shifted just a bit. Laura Culp actually had a beautiful birdie putt just now, which puts her one more stroke under par and keeps her in the lead. Emerging fan favorite Ron Kopp is now tied for second place with Karen Talbot at five under. And I just got word that Brian Moore, <laughs> God bless his soul, he threw his driver into a water hazard on seven, which, you know, should make for an interesting second half of play. I'm gonna have to see what on earth he gets into later today. As you can see, I'm now here with Laura on hole eight. Bogey, bogey. Did, did you just get a, a bogey? I, I thought you just had a birdie. No, Ron lost his dog bogey and I just saw him running over by the next hole. Have you seen a little gray Habernies with a little chariot behind him? Poor little thing. Can't use his back leg, so Ron and his family got him fitted with the best equipment. Oh wait, it looks like Ron's son, Andrew, scooped Bogey right up. Phew! Wow, that is fantastic. I haven't had the chance to actually meet Ron yet, but from everything I've heard, he's a brilliant attorney and seems to be very professional. I didn't picture him as a do-anything-for-your-dog kind of guy. I wonder what he's like in his personal life. Oh, I've known Ron for years. He's as kind and loyal as they come. Dedicated family guy and passionate about life. But don't take my word for it. You should hear what his friends and family have to say. You know, I think a lot of people see Ron um, inside the courtroom or when he's um, dealing with really tremendously complex cases. And so they see his game face, his adversarialness, you know, when we're dealing with really complex commercial pieces of litigation, um, it can be really intense. But outside of the courtroom, I've learned that Ron is really lighthearted. And I don't know that many people know that about him. Um, he doesn't take life too seriously. I also think he doesn't take any day for granted. And I really think that was probably a byproduct of how he was raised. 
Um, Ron has gone through just a tremendous amount of um, hardships as well in his life, both having lost his mom and sister at young ages from cancer. So I think that has really just instilled with him um, a light hardness um, that I really truly, truly enjoy <laughs> when we're not um, battling out in the courtroom. Question about his wife and his kids, golf, law, and not necessarily in, in that order. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I say he's equally passionate for all of them. And now his grandkids. He absolutely loves his grandkids. Well, who knew Ron was such a committed family man? What an impressively well-rounded person he is. Now he seems to really exemplify the first two H's in the logo of the 4-H that we learned about earlier and that's head and certainly heart. I'm starting to see why the fans are behind him. Now, we were also able to pull together another special guest in from the spectator stands who can give us even more insight into Ron as a father. Beside me, I have Ron's daughter, Megan, his oldest daughter. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your dad and share with us today? You know, well, first, gosh, I'm so surprised to be here. I mean, my dad is a celebrity, but I thought I was just here as a spectator today. Luckily, because my dad is who he is, I usually carry around some notes just for this very reason. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad is a family guy. Gosh, it's hard to narrow down my thoughts just about this aspect of him because he has done so much with us and for us as a family. I think though what stands out are all those small moments and experiences with him. Those are the memories that I have. Of course, he and my mom took us to Europe and Hawaii and out west and did so many big things with us, but sorry dad, if you hear this later on replay, you probably could have saved some money because that's not what stands out. So what does? The wicky wacky fricky fracky French toast on weekend mornings where he cracked eggs on his head and sometimes ours, which got a little bit messy. The daddy-daughter dates that I still remember from early elementary school, lunch and a swing set. Taking me to see him teach his law classes and explaining words to me on the way home that I had written down to ask him about. Taking Molly, Andrew and me sledding down the big hill at Fairlawn Country Club. The hugs and kisses bracelet that he gave me when I went to college. I know Molly, Andrew, and I remember doing Indian princesses and Indian guides with him when we were younger, even when he would leave a camp out at Camp Wainoa to run home for a minute, which turned into the length of a football game. <laughs> Molly loved dad's weekends in college where she got to take him to a Cubs game during her uh, year in Chicago. And Andrew will never forget parring the 17th hole on Firestone's North Course with my dad, especially since my dad inspired his love of golf early on. And we all remember the song he taught us that of course related to his love of family history. The Cop family is the best family that ever came over from old Germany. That may or may not have been sung around the dinner table while hanging spoons on our noses. That is a hidden talent of his. That love of family history and tradition is part of the glue that he and my mom used to create the family that we have today. And now that we are all grown up, we still notice these small moments, sometimes with the three of us and sometimes with his grandchildren. Liam and Graham get to enjoy the train that my dad sets up for them each Christmas. Maggie and Campbell always want him to tell them the Gwendolyn story that he made up for me when I was little. Gwendolyn wandered off on vacation, got trapped in a sandcastle, and a talking dolphin alerted everyone that she needed help. He has a voice for the dolphin. Just ask him after the tournament. <laughs> and speaking of vacations, he and my mom go with us every year to Hilton Head, our fav favorite family vacation spot from when we were younger. He loves spending time with Liam, Maggie, Campbell, Graham, and Reese at the beach, and we take them to the same old oak tree in Harbor Town to hear Greg Russell sing the same songs that he did 30 plus years ago. My dad and my mom have built a pretty strong branch on our family tree. 
through all of these small yet significant moments, which is evident by how close my siblings and I are, along with how close our children are as cousins, even though we live hours apart. Thanks so much for calling me in today. Oh, thanks for sharing with us today, Megan. Your dad seems like a really exceptional man. Wow, this is kind of turning into the Quran Cop Show today. Um, we haven't been able to catch up with him on the course yet, but we sure have learned a lot about the guy. Let's check in again to see how the leaderboard is shaping up. Um, how are things on the course, Justin? Thanks, Ann. I have some interesting leaderboard updates to share with you all. Now we have Karen tied for the lead with Laura at eight under, with a fan favorite Ron Kopp having fallen behind the leaders by two strokes. Tim Fitzwater slipped a bit in the rankings. He seemed to have been distracted by a large group of cyclers. I'm not sure what the heck they were doing on the course, but well, there they go again. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Dave Lieberth, he was also distracted by the Goodyear blimp lingering overhead. Marie and Rob really hit their strides, which is great to see, but Brian Moore just continues to struggle all day today. And I'm actually here with him on the 13th hole. Brian, <laughs> what, why don't you tell us what you have in plan for the, this lucky 13th hole? Well, Justin, it's really a number of things. First of all, Rob Malone told me that this was a tennis tournament. <laughs> Yeah, so I was completely unprepared. And by the time I figured things out, I had to borrow clubs from Laura Culp. And she's left-handed. Did you ever try to play golf backwards? Anyway, I've lost balls in every hazard on this course. Luckily, Ron Kopp gave me an extra sleeve of balls, and he loaned me his spare driver so I could keep playing. You know, he's always being of service one way or another. He's that guy. Really? We just keep learning more and more about the mysterious Mr. Cop at every hole. Well, Ron's not really that mysterious. Between serving on nonprofit boards like United Disability Services, Summit County Historical Society, Leadership Akron, and the Welty Family Foundation, and being a past president of the Ohio Bar Association, just about everyone in Akron knows Ron. In fact, I wasn't surprised to hear this morning that he's been a part of both 4-H and Leadership Akron Class 3. He's always using his time to help others. Okay, I'm hearing from the studio that we actually may have some more clips about Ron and his involvement in the Akron community. Diversity and inclusion has always been really, really important to me. As a, as, a, as a person and as a professional. And I've tried to make that a theme in everything that I've done. Yeah, Ron is, you know, there are two kinds of leaders that say there's the leader who relies on his title and the leader who relies on um, the quality of their behavior and obvious positive intent in order to move an organization forward. And I'd say Ron is that second kind of leader. Uh, anybody who's worked with him, I believe, uh, recognizes um, his sincerity uh, and his positive intentions. And I think they, they follow his lead because of that. You know, I think Ron was, uh, you know, one of the visionaries to look to expand to different um, areas where UDS really hadn't been involved. There was, um, you know, I mentioned the, the catering program, but we also had the Buckeye Baskets program um, and uh, eventually some, some other different inter enterprises and I think it was probably with uh, Ron's encouragement that UDS was sort of challenged to look outside of the box of our you know just the, the core services that we provide um, and seeing that there was much much more that we could do and, and did do. It was during Ron's time on the strategic planning committee that all aspects of diversity and inclusion uh, being raised gender, um, generational diversity uh, became a strategic priority for leadership back. And, and here we are, you know, a number of years later, still seeing it be an important part of uh, diversifying the leadership landscape of Akron. And I know that Ron is really proud of that. Okay, now, honestly, this Ron Cop guy seems too good to be true. You know, he's a brilliant attorney, a great family man, and we learned that he spends his free time serving others. What can't this Ron Cop guy do? 
Well, we have someone in studio with us now who knows a lot about leadership and service. Welcome to the program, Mary Osberger. I understand you're the CEO of the Ohio State Bar Association, and you worked closely with Ron during his tenure as president of the Ohio State Bar Association. Can you talk to us a little bit about Ron's dedication to service? Absolutely. Ron serves with vision and sincerity. He served as our president at a time when the legal profession and our bar are going through another transformational time. Our justice system was facing the opiate crisis. 70%, we learned that 70% of low income Ohioans legal needs were not being met. And non-lawyer online legal service providers were really trying to come into the market. Ron encouraged us, he embraced the challenge and he encouraged us to be bold. He helped us form our Futures Commission. He asked, what can the legal profession do to embrace and shape this change, not run away from it? How can we serve more people? And then he traveled the state and, and reached out and wanted to hear from lawyers and Ohioans across the state. Now, I won't mention how many things we lost along the way, like his coat, his car, his, um, <laughs> his jacket, his socks at times, but we always made it home and we heard from a lot of people. And this is the roadmap that we follow today. Under his leadership, we also hosted a statewide symposium and brought the profession together to talk about what we can do to address the opiate crisis. We are also still following this roadmap today. Finally, Ron serves by championing others. You just heard about his work that he's done to advance diversity and inclusion in our profession at his firm. He also did the same at our bar. He really helped us reinvigorate our work. He reconstituted our advisory council. He encouraged me to hire a director back at the time, before the time many people were doing so. He also extends a hand by mentoring others. You heard earlier from Jessica. He, he, he's just so encouraging and supportive. And you know that's what he did for me. I was a relatively new layer leader. He gave me the confidence I needed. He gave me a lecture or two at times. I'm sure we've all heard those. <laughs> but he just really provided the right words at the right time. And I just want to thank him because it's because of him that I'm the leader that I am today. Well, that's pretty fantastic, Mary. Thank you so much for being in the studio to share with us today. You know, that was really great insight into how Ron uses his hands to be of service to his community. Well, I think it's time for another leaderboard check. So let's see uh, what's happening out there as we start approaching the last few holes of the course. Thanks, Teresa. I'm here on hole 17, and wow, this tournament is getting really exciting. Just moments ago, Laura Culp was being heckled by a fan counting down the days until tax season begins, and she really lost her focus. And speaking of losing focus, boy, I'll tell you, that Brian Moore, man, he's fallen behind to 22 over par. I believe I saw him hitch a ride on the beverage cart. Our new front runner is Karen Talbot, the highly accomplished woman who won this tournament a year ago. And I'm lucky enough to be right here with Karen. Karen, can you tell me how players are selected to participate in the Liberth Vision Masters Tournament? Sure, Justin. There are a few very high standards that are taken into consideration when selecting the participants. The 4-H values of head, heart, hands, and health are a terrific foundation, but the tournament organizers insist that the participants also demonstrate community-centered leadership, of course involvement in Leadership Akron, pragmatism, hard work, uh, multi-dimensional thinking, and they must have helped to shape Akron into the community that we love. Sure. Wow, those are some very high standards to me, but after learning so much about Ron Kopp today, I can see exactly why he was selected to join this esteemed group. Karen, how confident do you feel that you'll be able to finish the win today? Well, I'm having a great day today, actually, and I feel pretty good about my game. But with Ron Kopp only one stroke behind me, anything could happen. Uh, Ron's very focused on his golf game, and if you know Ron, then you know that when he picks up a hobby, he really dedicates himself to it, and he likes to have a lot of fun. Indeed. So, do you know any other hobbies that Ron has enjoyed over the years? Oh, Ron has had many very interesting hobbies over the years. Uh, he was a high school wrestler, a horseback rider, a fan of blues music, a talented fly fisherman, and I think he's also watched enough episodes of his favorite TV show to be considered an honorary member of the Walton family. And I'm surprised, that, actually, that folks don't call him Ron Boy. 
<laughs> wow. Well, I'm not sure about all that, really. Uh, the same Ron who has had the intensity to lead the Ohio Bar Association is also a calm, patient fly fisherman. Well, Justin, don't take my word for it, but I bet your station has some clips that they could play for the viewers to back me up on this. Wow. Well, let's see if we can find some of those. acquainted with a judge from Toledo by the name of Jim Jensen. And Judge Jensen was a wonderful guy and um, an avid golfer, as I am and as Ron is. And um, he and Ron served most of their terms together on the board. I was gone by then and became um, spirited golf partners and golf opponents. And Ron has a pretty high opinion of his skill as a golfer, but um, Judge Jensen did pretty well in his matches against Ron. It did so well to the point where he began referring to Ron as 401k, standing for 401 cop, because he felt like the money he was win winning from Ron on the golf course was making a significant contribution to his retirement program. Many people know that his favorite sandwich that he's not allowed to eat anymore because of mom is a Lumberger cheese and onion sandwich. If you know Ron, and anyone who knows Ron will know the term copster. And um, a copster is something that Ron does that is sort of out of the blue and pretty funny and usually unintentional. Um, you know, like using golf as an example, um, the time we were on a partner's retreat and he was driving the golf cart and thought he was in forward near a creek, but he was in reverse and hit the pedal and backed it the car into the creek and the foursome literally had to get out and and push his our golf cart that I was riding in too out of the dish out of the creek um, and how that happened I don't know and well after golf we would all congregate at the pool for libations Ron's roommate showed up a few minutes later in his speedo bathing suit with nothing on his feet Ron said Hey, John Henry, you know you have to have shoes on to come into the pool. His answer back was, well, if you would give me my shoes back, I can comply. Well, that brought a good laugh because Ron was wearing his shoes for him. I love you. Well, I tell you, that Ron is truly a fascinating guy. Now we have one last special guest in our studio here today who has known Ron since their days as college roommates at Miami University. So welcome to the program, Sam Wilcoff. Hi, how are you, Teresa Ann? Thanks for giving me a little bit of time to talk about Ron this morning. <laughs> I met Ron over 50 years ago. We were introduced by a mutual friend who knew that both of us would be starting as freshmen at Miami University the fall of 1972. We decided to room together being away from home in a college environment had its challenges, but I think we helped each other. We always got along pretty well. So much so that we actually roomed together all four of our undergraduate years. At the end of our freshman year, we decided we'd like to be resident advisors in our dorm, and we did that for our sophomore and junior years. I think that resident advisor experience was probably our first introduction to leadership helping acclimate probably 120 so young men into a college atmosphere. We probably weren't totally successful, but we certainly tried and we certainly learned a lot. Ron was always cheery, honest to a fault, a great attribute for a lawyer. He was a good listener, offered great advice when he was asked for it. Ron was a real studious guy and in hindsight, I only wish I had uh, a little more of that had rubbed off on me. Those four undergraduate years forged a friendship that's lasted over 50 years, and I consider him a brother. Other than his brother David, I don't think there's anyone who's known Ron longer than I have. We've shared the best of times and the worst of times, some wonderful life cycle events, and some life cycle events that were terrible. For the challenges that Ron faced, he faced them with that good demeanor you all know and that I've known for 50 years. He's passionate about academics in his profession, his personal pursuits, his friends, and probably most of all, his family. You know, 
We live, unfortunately, in a very contentious society, and, and that's not good. Ron has navigated a profession that sometimes, or oft times, is known for its fiery situations. But Ron, as I said earlier, is a good listener, able to assess the situation and deal appropriately, trying never to cause too much anger or anxiety. And I believe that his softer style can often win out in the long run. Ron proves it every day. But there's others to mention. Ron, I know you. And you don't do what you've been able to do alone. Your wife, PJ, your children and grandchildren, they're all supportive, and you were deserving of that support. Several months ago, I was asked to describe Ron in a word. I'm not really very good with a question like that. At the time, I came up with the word true. And after the fact, I wasn't sure that that was really the best word, but I think I'm very sure now. Ron is very true. He's real and genuine and authentic. I'm proud of him. I'm honored to be here today, honored to be his friend. Good luck in the tournament, Ron. I love you, man. Thanks so much for being part of today's broadcast, Sam. Your relationship with Ron is clearly very special. It seems like Ron has touched a lot of lives over the years. He's very impressive indeed. Indeed. You know, Ann, this day has been unlike any other of the Lee Birth Community Vision Tournament. And we have spent much of the day learning about the fan favorite Ron Kopp. You know, he may have a chance to win this whole thing. That's right, Teresa. He began the day down a few strokes, but now he and Karen Talbot are battling it out on the 18th hole. The crowd is going to see a very exciting finish here today. Let's check in on the 18th hole to see who will take the win today. Well, hello. I'm here on the 18th hole, and man, this tournament has been super duper exciting. It looks like uh, we have an opportunity to actually see who's going to win this tournament. And some interesting things just occurred. Karen Talbot actually blew her putt, and she bogeyed this 18th hole. So it looks like she's actually probably not positioned to fulfill her title as the Liebeth Community Vision Masters Tournament champion. That's really unfortunate, Teresa. Yeah, it is. And, you know, speaking of Liebeth, even Dave Liebeth has left the tournament, and he has now joined Team Cop. Say what? He's now serving as Ron's fully decked out caddy. Well, you don't see that often. Oh, and here he comes right now. Hey, let's give it up for Dave Liebeth, the caddy. How you doing, Dave? We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, we need to get Ron up here on the 18th hole. Ron, you have a tremendous opportunity, and we are so appreciative of the fact that Dave Liebreth actually quit the tournament to become your caddy. It appears as though he wants to impart some of his sage wisdom to you in an effort to help you win this tournament. All you have to do is make that putt. <laughs> now, Dave, that's a driver, not a putter. What the heck's going on? Where'd you get that from, Moses or Methuselah? What is this? Yeah, that's what we need, a putter. Oh, goodness. It's even older than Tim Edwards. It is indeed. <laughs> All right. Now, Ron, Karen blew her putt. Yeah. She bogeyed the last hole. Right. This is an opportunity for you to birdie this hole and win this tournament. You right. can become the Masters champion. All right. Now, it's only about seven, eight feet. Right. I know you've made this kind of putt several times. Not in the last few weeks. Not in the last few weeks, <laughs> and certainly not in front of hundreds of your closest friends and family. No pressure. This is the first opportunity you've ever had to win this tournament. And so you've got to make this putt. All right. So let's come on over here. And I'll say, this ball looks about as old as that driver. <laughs> that was the best we had, huh? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> a top flight? Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. All right. Now all you have to do is make this putt. All right. You can step up here. We'll position the ball. 
all of the people in this room are with you. <laughs> we believe you can do this. Well, you couldn't have brought my putter from home. Yeah, here we go. All right. Now, I just want to make sure you understand that if you sink this, you win this tournament. Got it. Now, you, you can either put it with your eyes open or your eyes closed. I mean, I heard your golf game is that good. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure you're ready. I, I, yeah. Dave's got you the line. We should be all good. Once I put this ball down, I'm going to count you off to three, and I want you to hit the ball on the count of three. Got it. Ready? Yeah. Okay, folks. This is for the Masters Tournament win. Ron Kopp. One, two, three. It's in the hole! It's in the hole! Congratulations! You're the Masters Champion! Awesome job! I really didn't think you were gonna make it! Congratulations! Oh, look at this that. It looks good. Amazing. It looks good. It's online. I'll take that club Did he get the right speed? Did you get the right speed? The right speed? To the stage. Amanda oh, you Leffler, left it short? The board you left it short. The leadership oh, Akron board to present you with the coveted green master's jacket. <laughs> Come on over here, my friend. Let me take this one from you. That looks a little small. Please, in it. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Kopp, the Masters Champion. Well, that putt looked a lot easier than I thought it was going to go there. Uh, Ron, congratulations on your great putt, and congratulations on your achievements and your winning of this award today. Honestly, I cannot think of anyone more deserving of this award than Ron. Your contributions to Leadership Akron, to the greater Akron community, to the legal profession, to the state of Ohio are tremendous. And I'm sure all of you enjoyed hearing more about those today with me. Ron is an advocate, a visionary, a mentor, and a friend. And he often has impeccable judgment after all, it was you that nominated me to go on the Leadership Akron Board, which gives me the opportunity to speak to all of you fine folks this morning. Many of you may have similar stories that you want to share about Ron, and so I'd invite you on your tables today are some cards, you'll see these cards, um, where you can share your stories, your anecdotes, your congratulations. You can go ahead and leave those on the table, we'll collect them at the end, and make sure that Ron gets them at the end of the event. So without further ado, to present the official award, though this looks pretty official, to present the official award to Mr. Kopp this morning, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dave Lieberth. Um, many of you know Mr. Lieberth, of course, who is a founder of Leadership Akron, a lifetime trustee, and the person after whom this illustrious award is named. Dave embodies the passion and the service and the vision of this award, and I'm very happy to welcome Dave to the stage. Thank you, Amanda, and congratulations to Danny Zampelli and Steve Strayer, to Anne and Teresa, and to all those members of the team who have produced this morning's great show. The principal reason that I'm here is that uh, I outlived all the other members of Leadership Akron's founding steering committee. Uh, they would be stunned at what this program has done in 39 years. They'd be proud of the more than 1,500 graduates of our programs who actually reshape the institutions of this community every single day. Now, the Community Vision Award 
may bear my name, but since 2012, the luster of this recognition improves each year with each new recipient, and of course, that's very true this year. The selection committee is composed of former recipients of the award, and they choose someone whose work has been community-centered, has had impact, has been multidimensional, and has served leadership Akron. And Ryan Kopp could be the poster child for that description. His life story, so well told this morning, has been inspirational, worthy of our acclaim. So Ron, it gives me a great pleasure to present you with this award, the Silver Cup given to the winner of the Community Vision Masters Tournament. And <laughs> congratulations, Ron Cobb. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, David, and, and uh, wow, I don't know where Danny Zampelli is. Uh, Danny, since the beginning of this uh, event years ago, has uh, has always done the planning. And Danny, you've, you and your team have outdone yourselves again. Thank you, ladies, for all of your work. Uh, really appreciate that. I, I, I saw Danny at an event last week. And, you know, as you folks who've received this award before, you get a little nervous because you are completely in the dark. You know that people are being interviewed, being taped, all kinds of things are going on, but you're not allowed to know anything about what's going on. So I, I just mentioned to Danny, I, I said, Danny, you know, I still have a law license and I can still file a lawsuit. <clears throat> His response was, uh, and he's a retired captain of the Akron Police Department, he said, well, I still have a concealed carry permit, buddy. <laughs> This award is named for uh, my, my dear friend, Dave Lieberth, uh, the leader all other leaders aspire to be like. When I was uh, 20, a 20-something lawyer in this community just arriving uh, uh, to Akron, I saw in the Beacon Journal a letter to the editor written by Dave asking that, uh, that members of the community show up for an event that was being put on by the Summit County Historical Society. And uh, as you've heard a little bit, I, I enjoy history. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm interested in that. And, and uh, so I wrote a letter to Dave. This is before email. I actually wrote a letter to Dave, had never met him, and said, gee, if there's anything that I can do to help at the Historical Society, I'd love to do that. And so I don't know, at 28 or 29 years old, he put me on a committee. And then uh, uh, later on, I was on the board. And that was the beginning of my community service in, uh, in Akron. Um, and, and Dave really was responsible for that. So uh, there's, it's just one of hundreds of reasons why this award is named uh, for, for Dave Lieber. That's just the sort of thing that he's done as a, as a leader. So I do have a, a few remarks, but before I, I, I provide those, I, I, I have a few people to thank. And now that I've seen these videos and, uh, and some people on the stage, maybe I, I have some other things to say. I don't know. but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I can't but uh, start with, uh, with my beautiful, wonderful wife of 40 years. Uh, we celebrated our 40th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, why or how she's put up with me for all of these decades, I don't know. Uh, but I wouldn't have done anything anywhere in my profession, uh, in our community, anywhere without, without Jean Kopp, or as I, <clears throat> as I call her, PJ. So, honey, thank you so very, very, very much. Uh, I love you. Um, uh, I, uh, my, my kids are here, uh, Megan uh, and, uh, and Ben Schultz, and Megan, thank you for your, your just wonderful uh, words up from Columbus. Uh, Molly uh, is here. Molly got on the road with her kids yesterday and drove five and a half hours to be here, and will get on the road later this morning and drive five and a half hours back to Louisville, Kentucky to be with uh, her husband, Trent, who could not be here because he's back with our two-year-old uh, granddaughter, Reese, who's our only grandchild not here. Uh, Andrew, uh, I love you, buddy. We've had so many good times together, traveling, fishing, golfing. Uh, I just love you so much. And, and welcome also to your girlfriend, Sarah Dawes. Uh, really appreciate your being here. I haven't seen my little brother yet. I, I, I think he's in the, uh, in the audience somewhere, uh, Dave and, and, and uh, uh, his wife, Kelly, are, are here from Canton. Dave, I, 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 as I stand here, I, 
I think that maybe our, our sister and our parents are looking down uh, on, on us this morning and smiling. Um, and by the way, congratulations on, uh, on your, the buck that you got this week. He's a great hunter. The difference between he and I is I went fishing on Tuesday. I caught five or six fish and I let them all go. Uh, the buck for Dave was a little less lucky. Um, <clears throat> Bob Blackham, who's the chair of our law firm, and Jeff Casto, the chair before him. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Bob. Thanks to Retzel and Andrus. You all know in this community, you can't do in a community anything that I've done or so, many, uh, 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 so much of what you all have done without the support of your organization. And Retzel has always supported me and so many others uh, to do what we've wanted to do in our community. And Bob and Jeff uh, and, and Tim Oxenhurt, God, God bless him before that. Thank you for that. Uh, Steve Jones, my partner, my, my long, long time friend, thank you for being here from Columbus. Uh, Sam, thank you for your kind words. We've had quite a, quite a journey, my friend. Uh, first person I ever met in law school, Paula Seeger, uh, thank you so much to you and to Tom for being here. Mary Augsburger, uh, thank you for your kind words. Thank you for being here from Columbus. She has traveled all over the state this last two weeks in district meetings and yet made the time to drive up here from Shillacothe of all places yesterday. And past state bar presidents who are here, Carmen Roberto and Judge Linda Teodosio, thank you. Alan Nichols, uh, the CEO of the Akron Bar Association, thank you. Uh, one of my oldest friends, Judge Magistrate, or Magistrate Judge Tom Parker, we met in law school, or I'm sorry, in college, sat and studied for the bar together and were partners colleagues for 25 years before he went off to judge land where he is. And my uh, finally, well almost finally, my golf buddies from Fairlawn Country Club, uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, everybody at those tables know that uh, every one of you, every single one of you is a better golfer than me. Uh, and by the way, uh, I do owe a couple, of you, uh, a couple of you money from last weekend, but my wallet's at home. Uh, I'd especially like to call out among those friends, my dear friend Tim Edwards, who has won the Fairlawn Club Championship 14 times over four decades, has done so much in this community also, is one of the fine men I've ever known and has been my, uh, has been my mentor. Uh, I, I love you, man. And by the way, 81 years old last year in a match, he threw a 68 at me to beat me. So uh, he's just unbelievable. Folks, when I was 20 years old, I thought I might do something extraordinary. <laughs> well, instead, I've led a very ordinary life with a whole lot of extraordinary moments. You've seen some of them in my wife. Uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I forgot. What did I forget? Where are those grandchildren? Those grandchildren. So I, I'd like to point out that also here, is Maggie, Maggie is here, and Campbell is here, six years old. Campbell is uh, twins with Graham, and then our oldest grandchild, Liam. Uh, your grandma and I, guys, are so very, very proud of you. Very proud of you, and thank you for being here. I know it was really hard on you to have to miss a day of school. <laughs> um, and I also uh, w wanted to, to mention that uh, Steve and Janine Marks are here. Uh, I'm so grateful to you. I'm grateful for your friendship, but uh, m most especially, I'm proud of you as being the Polsky Award winners uh, this year. I'm so proud to have you in the audience. Um, and, by, and by the way, I think one of the things that you've seen, and as my buddy, uh, my buddy Steve Jones pointed out, one of my life's missions. Oh, I've lost my. my what? Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of my life's missions is apparently about every week to do what now are referred to as copsters. I, I'm always doing stupid stuff, so um, I, my purpose in life is really just to try to make people laugh, although it's usually not my uh, intention. So when I came to this town 43 years ago, I thought, you know, the young guy, I want to light a fire. Well, I have not. Uh, I have not lit a fire, as, uh, as some of you have done. Um, what I did do, though, I think occasionally, uh, was, to, uh, was to light a candle. 
I've tried to light a few candles along the way. As, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. All of us who have been in leadership positions uh, work to improve programming and finances and you know whatever boards we've led, we focus on that. Just got to keep our eye on the ball. But I think good leaders do their best to go well above and beyond that, as so many of you have done. In my case, I decided early in my career, and you've heard a little about it, to shine a light on our need to improve diversity in this community and beyond, to advocate for improved diversity on every podium uh, I could find, including this one, I guess. Celebrating our differences and allowing those differences to make us stronger has been the linchpin of most of what I've tried to do uh, in, in all of my years in the community, bar association and law firm work. Um, and so just a word or two about that. I, gee, I had the, the opportunity decades ago uh, to hire the first two women who would go on to become uh, partners in our law firm. One of my uh, real privileges in life was to call both of them on the night that they were voted into our partnership now many decades ago. I also had the, the privilege, along with Judge Tom Parker, of hiring our first two African-American uh, African lawyers. And, and when Bob Lackham formed our diversity and inclusion program a number of years ago, I asked if I might be its first chair, and he indulged me in that. When I had the honor to serve as uh, president of the African Bar Association, I, I made sure, and I would not leave that position until the next position was filled by an African-American, Jim Payne who became the first black president of the Akron Bar Association. He did just a wonderful job. Um, Mary and I worked so hard at the Ohio State Bar Association on diversity issues. Um, and I know that work continues, Mary. I watch it now a bit from afar. But really, thanks for being here, Mary, coming up and, and for your words. At Leadership Akron, I can't say enough about the vision of our former CEO, Mark Scheffler, who's here. He, you've heard, heard from, to expand our programming to, co to create opportunities for increased involvement on every spectrum, whether age, gender, race. While I was in a leadership position, Mark and I and many others worked so hard to create Leadership Akron Next for seniors, a strong affiliation with torchbearers for younger folks. Uh, Amanda and I and others worked so very, very hard on that, and it looks like it succeeded mightily. Diversity on board for our minority communities. I'm honored every year when diversity on board asks me to welcome the new class. The lapel pin, oh, that I was wearing, <laughs> I, that I was wearing uh, before I won this, uh, this jacket, uh, it says widen the circle. I wore that lapel pin every single day of the four years that I was either the vice chair or the chair of the leadership back on board. And I'm proud of the work we've done to accomplish widening the circle. I think we've done a good job, and we're going to continue doing a good job. And by the way, I and others at Leadership Act and worked so hard to make sure that I would be followed uh, by an African-American vice chair. And Burnett Williams, who I believe is here, was that person. And the challenge was not to get that accomplished, but rather to convince Burnett, who's so extremely busy, to take the position. And she did. And Burnett, you did. You did, you did just a wonderful job. I've had more than one person tell me during my years in the DNI space to stop telling them how to think. And because I keep hearing words like that and because I see too much in the news every day that is so disturbing, I know the, the battle is far from over. I ask all of you uh, uh, to keep it up. Uh, before I conclude, I want to mention that I can still, and I'm not going to do it, I can still by heart recite the 4-H pledge. Uh, it's the first pledge I think either I ever learned other than perhaps the, the Pledge of Allegiance. And Holly Mansager uh, is one of my oldest friends, and it was wonderful to see her on the screen. Um, people make fun of my looking into genealogy. They don't think that it's true that I'm a descendant of Charlemagne, <laughs> or as I call him, Grandpa Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> but I have proof, and any, anybody who wants to see it can come to my house and I'll show you. And I, I do want to mention, uh, mention was made of Jim, Judge Jim Jensen, whom we lost last year, uh, who nicknamed me 401K, and anybody at the State Bar who, if you just say, if you're down in Columbus, 
Have you seen 401? Uh, that, that's me. When Jim died, he knew he was dying, and he passed away. Uh, uh, Justice Pat Fisher told me about that as I was playing golf on the 17th hole at Furlong Country Club. Uh, uh, Judge Jensen, who we nicknamed, uh, thanks to Carmen Roberto Jenkins, belonged there. His father belonged there as a kid, and I felt like uh, it was a, just a wonderful place to have to hear that horrible news. But a few weeks later, his wife showed up at my door. I, I should preface it by saying that Jenkins and I always had a $2 Nassau bet, so a $6 bet. Uh, his wife, Lynn, showed up at my door with a, an envelope that Jim had prepared before he died with, uh, with six $1 bills. And I cherish that <clears throat> envelope to this day. So <clears throat> no fires, folks, uh, no fires, just candles, but hopefully candles that have shown a little light so that others can do great work uh, going forward. And just maybe one or two of those candles will have ignited a fire, maybe at some point, I don't know. What I love about every person in this room is that no one here, not one of you, is cursing the darkness. Every one of you is striving to leave this a better community than you came to. It's been my privilege over these decades to walk that path with you. <clears throat> I accept this award as one of you, and I thank you very, very much. <clears throat> My wife would tell you that before the internet and before kids even, I would like have some hunch on something and go down to the Summit County Library that at least used to have and maybe still has a genealogy section and get lost and realize that I'd missed dinner. I only knew that my uh, uh, great great grandfather had come from somewhere in Germany. Nobody knew where and I spent decades looking for that. And finally, in 2012, I found it. Uh, he was one of eight children who, with his uh, uh, siblings and his parents, came from a tiny little town in southwestern Germany and moved to Maslin, Ohio in 1869. And the reason nobody ever knew anything about them was that within one year, this very poor family of German immigrants in Maslin, Ohio, Mom, dad, and, and four of the eight children died of typhoid fe fever. It, the, 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 the town is uh, Gilsten, uh, which is now a part of a larger town called Herrenburg. Uh, and it's just beautiful. It's just stunning. <laughs> Hallo Ecken, Ohio. Mein Name ist Michael Rodesheim und ich bin hier, um Ihnen Glückwünsche und Grüße an Ron Kopp zu seiner Auszeichnung zu senden. Wie mir gesagt wurde, hat Herr Kopp starke Wurzeln in Deutschland, denen wir all seinen Erfolg zuschreiben können. Zwischen 1816 und 1870 wanderten viele Gutsteiner nach Amerika aus, darunter Rons Urgroßvater, seine Geschwistern und Eltern im Jahr 1869. Kopp ist ein bekannter Name in Gulstein und wir sind stolz zu wissen, dass Ron Kopp aus Akron, Ohio seinen Namen mit deutschen Wurzeln trägt und dass er sich positiv auf das Leben der Menschen gemacht hat. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Ron. Gulstein ist stolz auf Ihnen. Bitte genießen Sie jetzt dieses Stück Ihres deutschen Erbes. Please welcome the Donnerschwaben Brass Band.
This concludes the 2022 Liebert Community Vision Award. Ron will greet his guests in the lobby. Have a wonderful day and, like Ron, always strive for a leadership mastered. What you doing down here? I just stop in your feet and chuck a lug in your beer. Now I've been trying all week long. I've been to get to get ready to go back home. Just to get ready to go back home I've been just to get ready to go back home Hey, Billie Jean, I like your motorcycle style Are we gonna make our time worthwhile? About the natural star You don't act like a lady But you know how to love You don't act like a lady But you know how to love You don't act like a lady But you know how to love 